There is a special place where adults with developmental disabilities can go to find a safe haven, a place of wonderful opportunities and joy. Project ID has social opportunities, meal programs, fun recreation, career development, church services, and the largest Special Olympic team in the state. Project ID is a real community treasure. Please be a volunteer, sponsor a member, or donate what you can to Project ID, identity beyond disability. Hello, my lovely peeps. I hope you're doing well and have enjoyed the beautiful weather this week. If not, I think it's getting into the 60s today, so get out there. Of course, listen to me read first. All right, we, as you know, are going back to Charlie and the Chocolate Factory. Um, if you haven't been around, remember this is about Willy, Wink Willy Wonka's Chocolate Factory that had makes the best chocolate, but has been closed for several years. And now Charlie Bucket and four of his other people have been allowed into the factory. And Mr. Wonka is exploring it with them. Um, we have already lost, if you remember, we've already lost one of Charlie Bucket's peers um, as he got pulled up into a chocolate tube. So now we are in the great gum machine. So here we go. Mr. Wonka led the party over to a gigantic machine that stood in the very center of the inventing room. It was a mountain of gleaming metal that towered high over children and their parents. Out of the very top of it, three sprouted hundreds and hundreds, there sprouted hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of tiny, glass tubes and the glass tubes all curled downward and came together in a bunch and hung suspended over the enormous round tub as big as a bath. Here we go, cried Mr. Wonka, and he pressed three different buttons on the side of the machine. A second later, a mighty rumbling sound came from inside it and the whole machine began to shake and frighteningly, the steam began hissing out of it all over, and then suddenly the watchers noted that there was a runny stuff pouring out, out and over and inside of the hundreds of little tubes, squirting out to a great tub below. And in every single tube, the runny stuff was in a different color, so that all the colors of the rainbow, and many others as well, came sloshing and splashing into the tube. It was a lovely sight, and when the tub was nearly full, Mr. Wonka pressed another button, and immediately the runny stuff disappeared. A whizzing, whirling noise took its place, and then a giant wizard started whizzing round inside the enormous tub, mixing up all the different colors of liquid, like an ice cream soda. Gradually, the mixture began to froth. It became frothier and frothier and it turned from blue to white to green to brown to yellow and back to blue again. Watch, said Mr. Wonka. Click went the machine and the wizard stopped whizzing. And now there came a sort of sucking noise. And very quickly, all the blue froth, frothy mixture in the huge basin was sucked back into the stomach of the machine. There was a moment of silence. Then a few queer rumblings were heard, then silence again. Then suddenly the machine let out a monstrous, mighty groan. And at the same moment, a tiny drawer, no bigger than the drawer in a slot machine, popped out of the side of the machine, and in the drawer lay something so small and thin and gray that everyone thought it was a mistake. The thing looked like a little strip of gray cardboard. The children and their parents stared at the little gray strip lying on the, in the drawer. You mean, that's all? said Mike TV, disgusted. That's all, answered Mr. Wonka, gazing proudly at the result. Don't you know what it is? There was a pause. Then suddenly, Viol Violet Vulvergard, the silly gum-chewing girl, let out a yell of excitement. By gum, it's gum! she shrieked. It's a stick of chewing gum. There was a pause. Right, 
you are, then, cried Mr. Wonka, slapping Violet hard in the back. It is a stick of gum. It's a stick of the most amazing and fabulous and sensational gum in the world. Oh, look at all that gum. Goodbye, Violet. There we see the big machine and Mr. Wonka being proud. Goodbye, Violet. This gum, Mr. Wonka went on, is my latest and greatest, most fascinating invention. It's a chewing gum meal. It's, it's, it's. The tiny little strip of gum laying there is a whole three-course dinner all by itself. What sort of nonsense is this, said one of the fathers. My dear sir, cried Mr. Wonka, when I started selling this gum in the shops, it will change everything. It will be the end of all kitchens and all cooking. There will be no more shopping to do, no more buying of meat and groceries. There will be no knives, no forks at mealtimes, no plates. No washing up, no rubbish, no mess, just a little strip of Wonka's magic super gum. And that's all you'll ever need for breakfast, lunch, and supper. This piece of gum I've made just happens to be tomato soup, roast beef, and blueberry pie. But you can have almost anything you want. What do you mean? It's tomato soup, roast, and blueberry pie, said Violet Beauregard. Well... If you start chewing it, said Mr. Wonka, then that is exactly what you would get on the menu. It's absolutely amazing. You can actually feel the food going down your throat and into your tummy. And you can taste it perfectly and it fills you up. It satisfies you. It's terrific. Utterly impossible, said Veruca Salt. Just as long as it's gum, shouted Violet Beauregard. Just as long as it's a piece of gum and I can chew it. Then that's for me. And quickly she took her own world record, re record piece of chewing gum out of her mouth and stuck it behind her ear. Ooh, gross. Come on, Mr. Wonka, she said. Hand over this magic gum of yours and we'll see if it works. Now, Violet, said Mrs. Beauregard, her mother. Don't let's do anything silly, okay, Violet? I want the gum. Violet said obstinately. What's so silly about that? I would rather you didn't take it, Mr. Wonka told her gently. You see, I haven't got it quite right. There are still one or two things. Oh, to blaze us with that, said Violet. And suddenly, before Mr. Wonka could stop her, she shot out a fat hand and grabbed a stick of gum and little gum out of the little drawer and popped it into her mouth. At once, her huge, well-trained jaw started chewing away on it like a pair of, thong, of tongs. Don't, said Mr. Wonka. Fabulous, shouted Violet. It's tomato soup. It's hot and creamy and delicious. I can feel it running down my throat. Stop, said Mr. Wonka. The gum isn't ready yet. It's not right. Of course it's right, said Violet. It works beautifully. Oh, my, what lovely soup this is. Spit it out, said Mr. Wonka. It's changing, shouted Violet, chewing and grinning both at the same time. The second course is coming up. It's roast beef. It's tender and juicy. Oh, boy, what a flavor. The baked potato is marvelous, too. It's got crispy skin, and it's filled with butter inside. But how interesting, Violet, said Mrs. Beauregard. You are such a clever girl. Keep chewing, baby, said Mr. Beauregard. Keep right on chewing. This is a great day for the Beauregards. Our little girl's the first person in the world to have a chewing gum meal. Everybody was watching Violet Beauregard as she stood there chewing this extraordinary gum. Little Charlie Bucket was staring at her, absolutely spellbound, watching her huge rubbery lips as they pressed as they pressed and unpressed with the chewing. And Grandpa Joe stood behind him, gaping at the girl. Mr. Wonka was wringing his hands and saying, no, 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 it isn't ready for eating. It isn't right. You must stop. You mustn't do it. Blueberry pie and cream, shouted Violet. Here it comes. Oh, my, it's perfect. It's beautiful. It's, it's exactly as though I'm swallowing it. 
It's marvelous blueberry pie, the most marvelous in the world. Good heavens, girl, shrieked Mrs. Beauregard, suddenly staring at Violet. What's happening to your nose? Oh, be quiet, mother, and let me finish, said Violet. It's turning blue, screamed Mr. Beauregard. Your nose is turning blue as a blueberry. Your mother is right, shouted Mr. Beauregard. Your whole nose has, nose has gone purple. What do you mean, said Violet, still chewing away. Your cheeks, screamed Mrs. Beauregard. They're turning blue as well, so is your chin. Your whole face is turning blue. Spit that gum out at once, ordered Mr. Beauregard. Mercy, save us, yelled Mrs. Beauregard. The girl's going blue and purple all over. Even her hair is changing color. Violet, you're turning violet. Violet, what is happening to you? I told you I hadn't got it quite right, said Mr. Wonka, shaking his head sadly. I'll say you haven't, cried Mr. Beauregard. Just look at this girl now. Everyone was staring at Violet. And what a terrible, peculiar sight she was. Her face and hands and neck and legs, in fact, all the skin all over her body, as well as her great big mop of curly hair, had turned a brilliant purplish blue, the color of blueberry juice. It always goes wrong when we get to the dessert, sighed Mr. Wonka. It's the blueberry pie that does it, but I'll get it right one day. You wait and see. Violet, screamed Mrs. Beauregard, you're swelling up. I feel sick, Violet said. You're swelling up, screamed Mrs. Beauregard again. I feel peculiar, gasped Violet. I'm not surprised, said Mr. Beauregard. Good heavens, girl, screeched Mrs. Beauregard. You're blowing up like a balloon. Like a brought blueberry, said Mr. Wonka. Call a doctor, shouted Mr. Beauregard. Oh, look at her. She wasn't a teeny thing before. Prick her with a pin, said one of the other fathers. Save her, cried Mrs. Beauregard, wringing her hands. But there was no saving her now. The body was swelling and changing shape at such a rate that within a minute it had turned into nothing less than an enormous round blue ball, a gigantic blueberry. In fact, all that remained of Violet Beauregard herself was a tiny pair of legs and a tiny pair of arms sticking out of the great round fruit and a little head on top. It always happens like that, sighed Mr. Wonka. I've tried it 20 times in the testing room on 20 Oompa Loompas and every one of them finished up as a blueberry. It's most annoying. I just can't understand it. But I don't want a blueberry for a daughter, yelled Mrs. Beauregard. Put her back to what she was this instant. Mr. Wonka clipped his, clicked his fingers and 10 Oompa Loompas appeared immediately at his side. Roll Miss, Bull Bull Roll Miss Beauregard into the boat, he said to them, and take her along to the juicing room at once. The juicing room, cried Mrs. Beauregard. What are they going to do her to her there? Squeeze her said Mr. Wonka. We've got to squeeze the juice out of her immediately. After that, we'll just have to see how she comes out. But don't worry, my dear Mrs. Beauregard. We'll get her repaired. We'll get her repaired if it's the last thing we do. I am sorry about it all. I really am. Already the 10 Oompa Loompas were rolling the enormous blueberry across the floor of the inventing room toward the room that led to the Chocolate River where the boat was waiting. Mr. and Mrs. Beauregard hurried after them. The rest of the party, including little Charlie Bucket and Grandpa Joe, stood absolutely stu still watching them go. Look at the little Oompa Loompas rolling the great big blueberry girl. Listen, whispered Charlie. Listen, Grandpa. The Oompa Loompas in the boat are starting to sing. The voices, 100 of them singing together, came loud and clear into the room. Dear friends, we surely all agree. There's almost nothing to worry, you see. Then some repulsive little bum who's always chewing, chewing gum. It's very bad, as bad as those who sit around and pick the nose. So please believe us when we say the chewing gum 
will never pay. This sticky habit bounds to send the chewer of sticky to a sticky end. Do any of you know a person called Miss Bigelow? That dreadful woman saw no wrong in chewing, chewing all day long. She chewed while bathing in the tub. She chewed while dancing at her club. She chewed in church and on the bus. It really was quite ludicrous. And then she couldn't find her gum. She would chewed up the linoleum or anything that happened near a pair of boots, the postman's ear or other people's underclothes. And once she chewed her boyfriend's nose, she went on chewing till at last her cheek muscles grew so vast that from her face, her giant chin stuck out just like a violin for years and years. She chewed away consuming 50 bites a day until one summer's eve, alas, a horrid business came to pass. Miss Bigelow went late to bed for half an hour. She laid in red, chewing and chewing all the while, like some great clockwork, clockwork crocodile. At last she put her gum away using a special tray and settled back and went to sleep. She managed this by counting sheep. But now how strange, although she slept, those massive jaws of hers still kept on chewing, chewing through the night even with nothing there to bite. You were, they were, you see, in such a groove, they positively had to move. And very grim it was, grim it was to hear in pitchy dark, loud and clear, this sleeping woman's great big trap opening and shutting, snap, snap, snap. Faster and faster, chomp, 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 the noise went on and it wouldn't stop. Until at last her jaws decided to pause and open extra wide. And with the most tremendous chew, they bit the lady's tongue in two. Thereafter, just from chewing gum, Miss Bigelow was always dumb. And spent her life slurping up some disgusting sanatorium in some disgusting sanatorium. And that's why we tried so hard to save Miss Violet Beauregard from suffering an equal fate. She's still quite young. It's not too late. Provided she survives the cure, we hope she does. But we can't be sure. The Ilpa like to rhyme. rhyme. Now they're continuing along the corridor. corridor. Well, 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 sighed Mr. Wonka. Two naughty little children gone. Three good children left. I think we'd better get out of this room quickly before we lose somebody else. But Mr. Wonka, said Charlie Bucket anxiously, will Violet Beauregard ever be all right again or will she always be a blueberry? They'll deduce her in no time declared Mr. Wonka. They'll roll her into the deducing machine. She'll come out as thin as a whistle. But will she still be blue all over? Asked Charlie. She'll be purple, cried Mr. Wonka. A fine, rich purple from head to toe. But there you are. That was That's what comes from chewing disgusting gum all day long. If you think gum is so disgusting, said Mike TV, then why do you make it in your factory? I do wish you wouldn't mumble, said Mr. Wonka. I can't hear a word you're saying. Come on, off we go. Hurry up. Follow me. We're going into the corridors again. And so saying, Mr. Wonka scuttled across to the far end of the inventing room and went out of a small secret door hidden behind a lot of pipes and stoves. The three remaining children, Saruka Salt, Mike TV and Charlie Bucket, together with the five remaining grown-ups, followed after him. Charlie Bucket saw that they were now back in one of those long pink quarters, with many other pink quarters leading out of it. Mr. Wonka was rushing along in front, turning left and right and right and left, and Grandpa Joe was saying, keep a good hold of my hand, Charlie. It would be terrible to get lost in here. Oh, and there they go, running, running, running. Grandpa Joe's doing pretty good for an old man. Mr. Wonka was saying, no time for any messing around. We'll never get anywhere at the rate we're going. And he rushed down the endless pink quarters with his black top hat perched on the top of his head and his plum-colored velvet coattails flying out behind him like a flag in the wind. They passed a door in the wall. No time to go, shouted Mr. Wonka. Press on, press on. They passed another door and then another and another. There were doors 
every 20 paces or so along the corridor now, and they all had something written on them, and strange clanking noises were coming from behind several of them, and delicious smells came wafting through the keyholes, and sometimes little jets of colored steam shot out from the cracks beneath. Grandpa Joe and Charlie were half running and half walking to keep up with Mr. Wonka, but they were able to read what it said on quite a few of the doors as they hurried by. Edible marshmallow pillows, it said on one. Marshmallow petals are terrific, pillows are terrific, shouted Mr. Wonka as he dashed by. They'll all be the rage when I get them into the shops. No time to go in, though, no time at all. Lickable wallpaper for nurseries, it said on the next door. Lovely stuff, lickable wallpaper, cried Mr. Wonka, rushing past. It had pictures of fruit on it, bananas, apples, oranges, grapes, pineapples, strawberries, and snoozeberries. Snoozeberries? asked Mike TV. Don't interrupt, said Mr. Wonka. The wallpaper has pictures of all these fruits printed on it. And when you lick the picture of the banana, it tastes like a banana. When you lick a strawberry, it tastes like a strawberry. And when you lick a snozberry, it tastes exactly like a snozberry. But what does a snozberry taste like? You're mumbling again, said Mr. Wonka. Speak louder next time. On we go. Hurry up. Hot ice creams for cold days, it said on the next door. Extremely useful in the winter, said Mr. Wonka, rushing on. Hot cream warms you up, no end in freezing weather. I also make hot cubes for putting in hot drinks. Hot ice cubes make drinks hotter. Cows that give chocolate milk, it said on the next door. Ah, oh, my pretty little cows, cried Mr. Wonka. I love those cows. But why can't we see them, asked Veronica of Salt. Why do we have to go rushing past all these lovely rooms? We shall stop in time, called Mr. Wonka. Don't be so madly impatient. Fizzy lifting drinks, it said on the next door. Oh, these are fabulous, cried Mr. Wonka. They fill you up with bubbles, and the bubbles are full of a special gas, and this gas is so terrifically lifting that it lifts you right off the ground just like the balloon, and up you go until your head hits the ceiling, and there you stay. But how do you come down, asked little Charlie. You do a burp, of course, said Mr. Wonka. You do a great big, long, rude burp, and up comes the gas, and down comes you. But don't drink it outdoors. There's no knowing how high you'll be carried if you don't. If you do that, I gave some an old Oompa Loompa one in the backyard, and he went up and disappeared out of sight. It was very sad. I never saw him again. He should have burped, Charlie said. Excuse me. Of course he should have burped, said Mr. Wonka. I stood there shouting, burp, you silly ass, burp, you'll never come down again. But he didn't or couldn't or wouldn't, I don't know which. Maybe he was too polite. He must be on the moon by now. On the next door it said, square sweets that look round. Wait, cried Mr. Wonka, skidding suddenly to a halt. I'm very proud of my square sweet sweets. That, that look round. Let's take a peek. Square sweets that look round. Everybody stopped and cried, crowded into the door. The top half of the door was made of glass. Grandpa Joe lifted Charlie up so that he could get a better view. And looking in, Charlie saw a lot, long table. And on the table were rows and rows of small, white, square-shaped sweets. And the sweets looked very much like square sugar lumps, except that each one of them had a little, funny little pink face painted on one side. At the end of the table, a number of Oompa Loompas were busily painting more faces on more sweets. There you are, cried Mr. Wonka. Square sweets that look round. They don't look round to me, said Mike TV. They look square, said Veronica Salt. They look completely square. But they are square, said Mr. Wonka. I never said they weren't. You said they were round, said Veronica Salt. I never said anything of the sort, said Mr. Wonka. I said they looked round. But they don't look round, said Veronica Salt. They look square. 
They look round, insisted Mr. Wonka. They most certainly do not look round, cried Veronica Salt. Veronica, darling, said Mrs. Salt, pay no attention to Mr. Wonka. He's lying to you. My dear old fish, said Mr. Wonka, go and boil your head. How dare you speak to me like that, shouted Mr. Salt. Oh, do shut up, said Mr. Wonka. Now watch this. Oh, there they are. They look square to me. Little faces. Okay. He took a key from his pocket and unlocked the door and flung it open. And suddenly, at the sound of the door opening, all the rows of little square sweets looked quickly round to see who was coming in. The tiny faces actually turned toward the door and stared at Mr. Wonka. There you are, he cried triumphantly. They look, they're looking round. There's no arguing about it. They are square streets that look round. By golly, he's right, said Grandpa Joe. Come on, said Mr. Wonka. Stay close. Starting off the, down the corridor again. On we go. We mustn't dawdle. Butterscotch and butter gin, it said in the next door they passed. Now that sounds a little bit interesting, said Mr. Salt, Mr. Salt, Veruca's father. Glorious stuff, said Mr. Wonka. The Oompa Loompas all adore it. It makes them tiddly. Listen, you can hear them in there now, whooping it up. Shrieks of laughter and snatches of singing could be heard through the closed door. They're drunk as lords, said Mr. Wonka. They're drinking butterscotch and soda. They like it best of all. Butter gin and tonic is also very popular. Follow me, please. We really mu mustn't keep stopping like this. He turned left. He turned right. They came to a long flight of stairs. Mr. Wonka slid down the banister. The three children did the same. Mrs. Salt and Mrs. TV, the only women now left in the party, were getting very out of breath. Mrs. Salt was a fat creature and had short legs. She was blowing like a rhinoceros. This way, cried Mr. Wonka, turning left at the bottom of the stairs. Go slower, panted Mr. Mrs. Salt. Impossible, said Mr. Wonka. We should never get there in time if I did. Get where, said Veruca Salt. Never you mind, said Mr. Wonka. You just wait and see. Veronica in the nut room. Veruca in the nut room. Mr. Wonka rushed down the corridor. The night room, the nut room, it said on the next door they came to. All right, said Mr. Wonka, stop here for a moment and catch your breath and take a peek, peek through the glass panel in this door. But don't go in. Whatever you do, do not go in the nut room. If you go in, you'll disturb the squirrels. Everyone crowded around the door. Oh, look, Grandpa. Look, cried Charlie. Squirrels, shouted Veruca Salt. Crikey, said Mike TV. It was an amazing sight. 100 squirrels were seated upon sto stools all around a large table. On the table were mounds and mounds of walnuts. The squirrels were all working, working away like mad, shelling the walnuts at a tremendous speed. These squirrels are specially trained for getting nuts out of the walnuts, Mr. Wonka explained. Excuse me a minute. Don't chew your blanket. Sorry, I had to talk to Otis. These squirrels are especially trained. Why use squirrels? Mike TV asked. Why not use Oompa Loompas? Because, said Mr. Wonka, Oompa Loompas can't get walnuts out of walnut shells in one piece. They always break them in two. Nobody except squirrels can get walnuts whole out of the walnut shells every time. It is extremely difficult. But in my factory, I insist on one whole walnut. Therefore, I have to have, to do, have the squirrels to do the job. Aren't they wonderful the way they get those nuts out? And see how they first tap each walnut with their knuckles to make sure it's not a bad one? If it's bad, it makes a hollow sound, and they don't bother to open it. They just throw it down the rubbish chute. There, look. Watch that squirrel next to us. I think he's got a bad one now. They watched, oh, there's the squirrel tapping. They watched the little squirrel as he tapped the walnut shell with his knuckles. He cocked his head to one side, then to the other, listening intently. 
Then suddenly he threw the nut over his shoulder into a large hole in the floor. Hey, mommy, said Veruca Salt suddenly. I've decided I want a squirrel. Get me one of those squirrels. Don't be silly, sweetheart, said Mrs. Salt. These all belong to Mr. Wonka. I don't care about that, shouted Veruca. I want one. All I've got at home is two dogs, four cats, and six bunny rabbits, two parakeets, three canaries, a green parrot, a turtle, and a bowl of goldfish, and a cage of white mice, and a silly old hamster. I want a squirrel. All right, my pad, Mrs. Salt said soothingly. Mommy will get you a squirrel just as soon as she possibly can. But I don't want any old squirrel, Veruca shouted. I want a train squirrel. At this point, Mrs. Salt, Mr. Salt, Veruca's father, stepped forward. Very well, Wonka, he said importantly, taking out a wallet for full of, walk it, a wallet full of money. How much do you want for one of those squirrels? Name your price. They're not for sale, Mr. Wonka answered. She can't have one. Who says I can't, shouted Veruca. I'm going in to get myself one this very minute. Don't, said Mr. Wonka quickly, but he was too late. The girl had already thrown open the door and rushed in. The moment she entered the room, 100 squirrels stopped what they were doing and turned their heads and stared at her. They stared at her with small, beady black eyes. Veruca Salt stopped also and stared back at him. Then her gaze fell upon a pretty little squirrel sitting next to her at the end of the table. The squirrel was holding a wallet in its paws. All right, Veruca said, I'll have you. She reached out her hands to grab the squirrel, but as she did so, in that first second, when her hand started to go forward, there was a sudden flash of movement in the room, like a flash of brown lightning, and every single squirrel around the table took a flying leap toward her and landed on her body. Twenty-five of them caught hold of her right arm and pinned it down. Twenty-five more caught, caught hold of her left arm and pinned it down. Twenty-five caught hold of her right leg and anchored it to the ground. Twenty-four caught a hold of her left leg. And the one remaining squirrel, obviously the leader of them all, climbed up onto her shoulder and started tap, tap, tapping, tap, tap, tapping the wretched girl's head with its knuckles. Save her, screamed Mrs. Salt. Veruca, come back. What are they doing to her? They're testing her to see if she's a bad nut, said Mr. Wonka. Just watch. Veruca struggled furiously, but the squirrels held her tight and she couldn't move. The squirrel on her shoulders went tap, tap, tapping the side of her head with his knuckles. Oh. Excuse me, friends. My goodness, she is a bad nut. After all, said Mr. Wonka, her head must sound quite hollow. Veruca kicked and screamed, but it was no use. The strong, tiny paws held her tightly and she couldn't escape. Where are they taking her? Shrieked Mrs. Salt. She's going where all the bad nuts go, said Mr. Willy Wonka. She's going down the rubbish chute. By golly, she is going down the chute, said Mr. Salt, staring through the glass door at his daughter. Then save her, cried Mrs. Salt. Too late, said Mr. Wonka. She's gone. And indeed she had. But where, shrieked, shrieked Mrs. Salt, clapping her arms. What happens to the bad nuts? Where does the chute go to? That particular chute, said Mr. Wonka, runs directly into the great big main rubbish pipe, pipe, which carries all of the rubbish from every part of the factory, all the floor sweepings, potato peels, rotten cabbages, fish heads, and stuff like that. Who eats fish heads and cabbage and potatoes in this factory, I'd like to know, said Mike TV. I do, of course, answered, Mrs. Answered, answered Mr. Wonka. I don't think, and you don't think that I'd live on cacao beans, do you? But, 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 shrieked Mrs. W Mrs. Salt, where does that great big pipe go in the end? Why, to the furnace, of course, Mr. Wonka said calmly, to the incinerator. Mrs. Salt opened her huge red mouth and started to scream. Don't worry, said Mr. Wonka. There's always a chance that they've decided not to light it today. A chance, yelled Mrs. Salt. 
my darling Veruca, she'll, she'll, she'll be sizzling like a sausage. Oh boy, she can't open her mouth and scream, can't she? Mr. and Mrs. Salt do not look happy. Quite right, my dear, said Mr. Salt. Now see here, Wonka, he added. I think you've gone just a shade too far this time. I do indeed. My daughter may be a bit of a frump. I don't mind admitting that. But that doesn't mean you can coast and roast her to a crisp. I'll have you know I'm extremely cross about this. I really am. Oh, don't be cross, my dear sir, said Mr. Wonka. I expect she'll turn up again sooner or later. She may not even have gone all the way down. She may be stuck in the chute just below the entrance hole. And if that's the case, all you'll have to do is go in and pull her up again. Hearing this, both Mr. and Mrs. Salt dashed into the nut room and ran over to the hole in the floor and peered in. Veruca, shouted Mrs. Salt. Are you down there? There was no answer. Mrs. Salt bent further to get a closer look. She was now kneeling right on the edge of the hole with her head down and her enormous behind sticking up in the air like a giant mushroom. It was a dangerous position to be in. She needed one little tiny push, one gentle nudge in the right place. And that is exactly what the squirrels gave her. Over she toppled into the hole head first, screeching like a parrot. Good gracious me, said Mr. Salt as he watched his wife, fat wife, go tumbling down the hole. What a lot of rubbish there's going to be today. He saw her disappearing into the darkness. What's it like down there, Angina? He called out. He leaned further forward. Well, I shouldn't do that. The squirrels rush up behind him. Help, he shouted, but he was already toppling forward, and down the chute he went, just as his wife had done before him. And his daughter. Oh, dear, cried Charlie, who was watching with the others through the door. What on earth is going to happen to them now? I expect someone will catch them at the bottom of the chute, said Mr. Wonka. But what about the great fire incinerator? asked Charlie. They only light it every other day, said Mr. Wonka. Perhaps this is one of the days when they let it go out. You never know. They might be lucky. Shh, said Grandpa Joe. Listen, here comes another song. From far away down the corridor came the beating of drums. Then the singing began. Baruka Salt, sang the Oompa Loompas. Baruka Salt, the little brute, has just gone down the rubbish chute. And just as we rightly thought that in a case like this we ought to see the thing completely through, we polished off her parents too. Down goes Baruka down the drain. And here, perhaps we should explain that she will meet as she descends a rather different sort of friends. To those that she has left behind, these won't be nearly so refined. A fish head, for example, cut this morning from a halibut. Hello, good morning. How do you do? How nice to meet you. How are you? And then a little further down, a mass of others gather round. A bacon rind, some rancid lard, a loaf of bread gone stale and hard, a steak that nobody could, could chew, an oyster from an oyster stew. Some liverwurst, so old and gray, one smells it from a mile away. A rotten nut, a reeky pear, a thing that the cat left on a chair. Mm. And lots of other things as well, each one with a rather horrid smell. These are Veruca's newfound friends that she will meet as she descends. And this is the price she has to pay for going so very far astray. But now, my dears, we think you might be wondering, is it right that every single bit of blame and all the scolding and all the shame should fall upon Veruca Salt? Is she the only one at fault? For though she spoiled and dreadfully so, a girl can't spoil herself, you know. Who spoiled her then? And indeed, who indeed? Who pandered her to her every need? Who turned her in su into such a bra brat? Who are the culprits? What do you ask? Alas, you needn't look so far to find out who these sinners are. They are, and this is very sad, her loving parents, mom and dad. And that is why we're glad they fell into the rubbish chute as well. Excuse me. 
the grace the great glass lid. I've never seen anything like it, cried Mr. Wonka. The children are disappearing like rabbits. But you mustn't worry about it. They'll all come out in the wash. Mr. Wonka looked at the little group that stood beside him in the quarter. There are only two children left now, Mike Teavy and Charlie Bucket. And there were three grown-ups, Mr. and Mrs. Teavy and Grandpa Joe. Shall we move on? Mr. Wonka asked. Oh, yes, cried Charlie and Grandpa Joe both together. My feet are getting tired, said Mark TV. I want to watch television. Well, if you're tired, we'd better take the lift, said Mr. Wonka. It's over here. Come on, in we go. He skipped across the passage to a pair of double doors. The door slid open. The two children and the grown-ups went in. Now there, Mr. Wonka said. Which button shall we press first? Take your pick. Charlie Bucket stared around him in astonishment. This was the craziest lift he'd ever seen. There were buttons everywhere. The walls and even the ceiling were covered all over with rows and rows and rows of small black push buttons. There must have been a thousand of them on each wall and another thousand on the ceiling. And now Charlie noticed that every single button had a tiny printed label beside it telling you which room you would like to be taken to if you pressed it. This isn't just an ordinary lift up and down announced Mr. Wonka proudly. This lift can go sideways and long ways and slant ways and any other ways you can think of. It can visit any single room in the whole factory, no matter where it is. You simply press the button and zing, you're off. Fantastic, murmured Grandpa Joe. His eyes were shining with excitement as he stared at the rows of buttons. Oh, the whole lift is made of thick, glare, glare, clear glass, Mr. Wonka declared. Walks, doors, ceilings, floor, everything is made of glass so that you can see out. But there's nothing to see, said Mike TV. Choose a button, said Mr. Wonka. The two children must each press one button. So take your pick. Hurry up. In every room, something delicious and wonderful is being made. Quickly, Charlie started reading some of the labels alongside the buttons. The rock candy mine, 10,000 feet deep, it said on one. Coconut skating, ice skating rink, said another. Then, strawberry juice water pistols. Toffee apple trees for planting out in your garden. All sizes. Exploding sweets for your enemies. Luminous lollies for eating in bed at night. Mint jubilees for the boy next door. They'll give him green teeth for a month. Cavity filling caramels. No more dentists. Stick jaw for talkative parents. Wiggle sweets that wiggle delightfully in your tummy after swallowing. Invisible chocolate bars for eating in class. Sugar-coated pencils for sucking. Fizzy lemonade swimming pools. Magic hand fudge. When you hold it in your hand, you taste it in your mouth. Rainbow drops. Suck them and you can't spit them and you spit them out in six different colors. Well, come on, pick, cried Mr. Wonka. We can't wait all day. Isn't there a tele television room in all this lot? Asked Mike TV. Certainly there's a television room, Mr. Wonka said. That button over there. He pointed with his finger. Everybody looked. Television chocolate, it said on the tiny label beside the button. Whoopee, shouted Mike TV. That's for me. He stuck out his thumb and pressed the button. Instantly, there was a tremendous whizzy noise. The doors clanged shut and the lift leaped away as though it had been stung by a wasp, but it leaped sideways. And all the passengers, except Mr. Wonka, who was holding onto the strap from the ceiling, were flung off their feet to the floor. Get up, get up, cried Mr. Wonka, roaring with laughter. But just as they were staggering to their feet, the lift changed directions and swerved violently around a corner, and over they all went again. Help, shouted Mrs. TV. Take my hand, madame said Mr. Wonka gallantly. There you are. Now grab this strap. Everybody grab a strap. The journey's not over yet. Old Grandpa Joe staggered to his feet and caught hold of a strap. Little Charlie, who couldn't possibly reach it as high as that, put his arms around Grandpa Joe's legs and hung on tight. The lift rushed on at the speed of a rocket. Now it was beginning to climb. It was shooting up and up and up on a 
steeply slanty course as if it were climbing a very steep hill. Then suddenly, as though it had come to the top of the hill and gone over a precipice, it dropped like a stone, and Charlie felt like his tummy was coming right up into his throat. <laughs> Look at him, all hanging on so tight. Grandpa Joe shouted, Whoopee, here we go. And Mrs. TV cried out, The rope has broken, we're going to crash. And Mr. Wonka said, Calm yourself, my dear lady, and patted her comfortingly on the arm. And then Grandpa Joe looked down at Charlie, who was clinging to his legs, and he said, Are you all right, Charlie? Charlie shouted, I love it. It's like being on a roller coaster. And through the glass walls of the lift, as it rushed along, they caught set sudden glimpses of strange and wonderful things going on in some of the other rooms. An enormous spout with brown sticky stuff oozing out onto the floor. A great craggy mountain made entirely of fudge with Oompa Loompas all roped together for safety, hacking huge hunks of fudge out of the sides. A machine with white powder spraying out like a snowstorm. A lake of hot caramel with steam coming off it. A village of Oompa Loompas with tiny, ho tiny houses and streets and hundreds of Oompa Loompa children no more than four inches high and were playing in the streets. And now, in the lift, it began flattening out again, but it seemed to be going faster than ever. And Charlie could hear the scream of the wind outside as it hurtled forward and it twisted and it turned and it went up and it went down. I'm going to be sick, yelled Mrs. TV, turning green in the face. Please don't be sick, said Mr. Wonka. Then you better stop, said Mrs. TV. Then you better take this, said Mr. Wonka, and he swept his magnificent black top head off his hair and held it out upside down in front of Mrs. TV's mouth. Ook. Make this awful thing stop, ordered Mr. TV. Can't do that, said Mr. Wonka. It won't stop until we get there. I only hope no one's using the other lift at this moment. What other lift? screamed Mrs. TV. The one that goes the opposite way on the same track as this one, said Mr. Wonka. Holy mackerel, cried Mr. TV. You mean we might have a collision? I've always been lucky so far, said Mr. Wonka. And I am going to be sick, yelled Mr. TV. No, no, said Mr. Wonka. Not now, we're nearly there. Don't spoil my hat. The next moment there was a screeching of brakes and the lift began to slow down and then it stopped altogether. Same ride? That was some ride, said Mr. TV, wiping his great sweaty face with his handkerchief. Never again, gasped Mrs. TV. And then the doors of the lift slid open and Mr. Wonka said, just a minute now, listen to me first. I want everybody to be very careful in this room. There is dangerous stuff around in here and you must not tamper with it. All right, let's look at the time. I think everybody, we will, we start a little early, so we will end right here. So remember, the television chocolate room is coming up next week. Now, don't forget, Easter is coming. So a week from Sunday is Easter. And let's remember that besides chocolate and bunnies, we want to really celebrate what God did for us, what Jesus did for us when he died on the cross and then rose again in order to pay for all of our sins. So let's remember that that's the true meaning of Easter. And I hopefully I will see you soon. Everything seems to be opening up according to plan. So who knows? Maybe I'll see you in a month or so. I'm very happy to be with you today. Bye, all. There is a special place where adults with developmental disabilities can go to find a safe haven, a place of wonderful opportunities and joy. Project ID has social opportunities, meal programs, fun recreation, career development, church services, and the largest Special Olympic team in the state. Project ID is a real community treasure. Please be a volunteer, sponsor a member, or donate what you can to Project ID, identity 